All right. We are live. Um, so thanks, everybody, for watching. Uh, I've got Sean Dereger. Yeah. Good job. On this episode with me. And um, it's been a couple weeks. I've had quite a bit going on, but this is going to be the 13th episode in this <laughs> short series I've been doing on deconstruction. Um, and the, the purpose of this series is more just to go, number one, throughout my journey of the different splinters that ultimately led to my deconstruction and just to share that with folks. Um, and I've, I've met some people along the way who have been encouraging in the process, and Sean is one of those. Um, I think it's helpful when you meet people that are part of the same previous circles that you were in mm -hmm. that actually understand and kind of get where you're coming from. Um, and so Sean's definitely one of those people who I met through, through Sarah. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to, to have you on, Sean. Um, so I thought initially you could just kind of introduce yourself. Um, you can talk about yourself better than I can. So I'll let you introduce <laughs> yourself. And then uh, we can just chat about your story and, you know, kind of see where it goes from there. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've, that's debatable. I know how well I can talk about myself because I'm one of those people that hates talking about myself, but I'll do I'll do the best I can. I can do, uh, you know, best I can. But I mean, this kind of stuff I always love talking about. And uh, I'm always one of those people that at a party, you know, instead of talking about like the latest football game or, you know, how your team's doing, I'm. I'll have a few, a few too many drinks and then all of a sudden break out like religion and politics. So I've, I've always been like that. Um, so then I've always been like someone who questions things and, you know, I, so yeah, where to start, right? Like, I don't know exactly where to start, but let me start with the whole, I guess the whole deconstruction thing, right? So how we kind of connected. So um, yeah. back in 2012, um, I started a podcast called The Armchair Philosopher as a way for me to kind of parse what I was thinking and um, questioning. And there were like no spaces for someone who was raised in the evangelical, fundamentalist, whatever, um, to basically like have questions. Um, anytime that I'd bring something up like gay marriage or anything else like that that was going on politically in California at the time. <clears throat> um, of course, I'm going to get all fro you know, frog in my throat now. <clears> throat> um, I'm going to mute my mic for a second, I think. Can I do that right here? Yeah, just hit the... Here, so I, I can do it. Mute. You're good. <clears throat> <laughs> there you go. All right, we got all that out. Hey, so, um. <clears throat> Yeah, there was nothing, you know, to to no avenues to discuss this stuff. So I um, I had moved to California to get married. I met my wife, Jennifer, when I was uh, living in Oklahoma and I was kind of in Tulsa, um, you know, Midwest. At that time, like I was looking for all the cool churches and cool worship and music is has always been a huge thing for me so i was always trying to find like the cool the churches with the good worship you know the, the experience and uh so when i met my wife jennifer she was going to arama bible college um which is owned or started by kenneth hagan oh um, yeah so i met her she was in all that um I, but i'd always been someone who would who like questions stuff but every time I did, it was like someone farted in the room. Like it was just like, you were never, it was a conversation killer, friendship killer, even like, um, so I was kind of kept that kind of stuff to myself and just chalked it up to like, well, I went through my rebellious phase, you know, after high school and <clears throat> into college. So in 2012, when I just, when I tragedy kind of struck our family, my, my wife's brother passed away in a car accident. And um, I was working for a company called Not of This World, NOTW. They had stores. They were kind of like Christian Hot Topics. Yeah. Called C2A. yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know you worked for them. That's cool. Yeah, I was the accounts manager for the wholesale department of the clothing line. So Dang. they wouldn't they wouldn't sell shirts like this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
so so I'm working for that company. I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of tails. I'm going to go everywhere. So if you need to rein me in, just do that with a question right. or whatever. Um, Cause I kind of, my, my brain processes a uh, thing is crazy. Um, so I was working for this company. I already was, I was already kind of questioning things, but of course couldn't say anything. And there's a few people at the company that I could be myself around the IT guy, um, a couple of the warehouse guys. My brother-in-law was awesome. Um, he was kind of in the same realm where he was questioning a lot of stuff. Um, he, you know, had to hide his partying, had to hide his drinking, had to hide his smoking. He worked for a church. He had to hide all that stuff. He couldn't be himself to just kind of like explore, you know, like we kind of need that to kind of like spread our wings and kind of figure out who we are. Right. And so, you know, we were kind of in the same boat. We're not allowed to do that. You know, not allowed to kind of find out who we are really. So he, um, he had, a, you know, he drank a little bit too much one night, got behind the wheel, decided he wanted to see, he wanted to see his girlfriend and he got in a car accident. And um, in the meantime, my father-in-law would be at, um, he would be at the front of the church, you know, trying to intercede, right? You know, because he knew his son was, he knew he knew his son had a, drinking issues, smoking. He, he knew there was things that he, you know, in his mind, like, oh, my son needs to work on this. He's not going to church. So he, my father-in-law would go to the, in front of the church all the time to, you know, intercede for my brother-in-law. And then he gets in this car accident and, and passes away. Um, and seeing you know so working at this christian company seeing how like you know another example of how god just didn't seem to give a shit um even though someone's trying really hard to for their son to be you know be okay and be safe and i was supposed to work for this christian company that's having bible studies every wednesday so that was like a huge kind of conflict in, in my life so in the meantime i'm slowly unraveling deconstructing um as i'm going through all this working all this out in my brain i started listening to um jay baker uh revolution church podcast mm -hmm. his sermons so i was kind of finding this other side of christianity that felt more real to me i guess of what i was told how i was told christians were supposed to act how G what jesus's example was um and it's all like butting heads with what I'm seeing in these kind of like mega churches, you know, these cool churches. Uh, and, you know, um, so I was processing all this, ended up <clears throat> uh, quitting the, the C2A job and actually taking the job that my brother-in-law let you know, left. I took over his spot wow. at a land of a local you know, land developer, friend of the family. So it's like, that's a lot to process when, yeah. you know, you've been raised a certain way, um, you know, that if you just follow Jesus's law, God's law, you know, you'll be fine. Um, there's the whole pros you know, the prosperity type of teaching, you know, just so and you'll receive, you know, and here I was like trying to check all the boxes and, and, and especially my wife and my, my in-laws and, you know, and like just that didn't seem to matter. So. I is that kind the of context? Is that the context you were raised in? Was those type of churches? It it wasn't. So um, so that's where I was when I kind of started getting the seed of like I guess the seed of doubt. Right, the splinters, um, like those <laughs> unconscious doubts that start. Yeah. Um, but actually, I and it makes so much sense as I think, you know, think all this through. I was my dad. Uh, I, so I was raised in they were kind of like a, a non-denominational church when I was a kid. It, um, charismatic, kind of charismatic, small little gathering. They were kind of, they're hippie. My parents were hippies in, in the Bay area, uh, San Francisco Bay area. And they all, and all the friends, they all started, started a church. Um, you know, wanted to do good things. They all found Jesus. They burned their black Sabbath records. And, um, and then that church eventually kind of became a cult because the, the pastor kind of had too much power. <clears throat> and he, you know, 
<clears throat> and there was other things going on in that church. And my parents decided to leave. And then we went to like just kind of a Lutheran church. And I was in a Lutheran church for kind of th for the rest. So religion was a big part of my life. Um, it was in my mind, like shoved down my throat a little bit with, you know, like no TV. They got caught up in like the, the satanic panic in the 80s. And, um, <clears throat> you know, no television. At one point, there's no TV in our house for like maybe two years. Wow. Horror movies, heavy metal, Dungeons and Dragons, Smurfs, oh. Sesame Street. Wow. Uh, we couldn't go to. So that's what you're compensating for now. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. It, it is true. Um, you know, we couldn't go to Chuck E. Cheese because uh, gay people might work there and they might, we might oh get sick. God. You know, it was all this stuff. And I don't know, you know, thinking back, like, I don't know if it was from my parents. My parents were just kind of regurgitating what they heard, you know, what they heard. Because they were, you know, they were in their 20s and early 30s, you know, um, around that time. So, so yeah. So, I mean, but it, but it was very Bible based. Like the Bible is the word of God. And every jot and tittle is the word of God. Right. So my parents, my dad didn't like the prosperity teaching. Um, he liked, he, he figured there's, there's, it was more, there's God's law. There is, you know, there's ways to live within God's law. Um, he was all about, you know, being a martyr um, was, was, was a, a good thing. Um, kind of suffering for Christ people aren't going to like you and, but also to spread the gospel is what I was kind of raised with. Right. And did you and, internalize that? Like as a, as a kid, was that something that was a big part of your identity? It, well, it definitely, it definitely was. So we moved from um, Northern California, the Bay area to Iowa. And that's when we got in. Then, um, so my parents let, went away from their Lutheran church and we got involved in this e, e free evangelical free church, which is they're all over the Midwest. And right, right. Um, mm -hmm. that would be, that definitely would be more of a fundamentalist, you know, um, I learned the word purpling where, you know, don't, hug, don't get too close to another girl, you know, because don't flirt at church and don't, you know, you don't want to let that seed of uh, lust in and things like that. Uh, so, but I mean, where was it going with all that, all that? So, but you know, so the, it was, it was all about the Bible with my parents and my dad would call out church leaders all the time. And he would be frustrated that he couldn't be the one teaching because uh, he had a different view of the Bible than, you know, like the elders of the church. And he, I remember, I mean, and I wish that it's one of those things like you wish you can be like, if I, if I was my age now seeing my dad in that scenario, like it would be very interesting to see because I'm seeing him and I are very similar with our passion. It's just our passion has gone different, a different direction. Right. But he, but we're all, we're, we're kind of, him and I are very much like we want to kind of, you know, poke at the dragon. We want to kind of, you know, antagonize a little bit, get a rise out of somebody. We kind of want to have our own views on something. And, you know, so, you know, in like a weird way, my dad was pretty punk rock because, and then I gravitated more to like, you know, punk rock just for, I like the anti-establishment stuff. But my dad was like anti-establishment in religion, but just the other way. Like the Bible's the word of God and is not to be messed with. <clears throat> and all these other churches just don't have the deeper understanding of, right. of the Bible like I do. Because I've been studying it more. Or I have a better understanding. I take it more seriously. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so we, we would read the Bible all the time. Um, and and it's, it's funny because all that was fine learning how to love your neighbor and you know um how you know we are saved from hell hell was a big deal how we are saved from hell i mean all there there is a lot of like um like my upbringing i used to like fault my parents for it but now that i'm a parent of teenagers um i see that it's less them uh trying to you know put something over me but just them being concerned in their way and what their understanding of what right. being a Christian was. So, um, so, so yeah, so I, so 
I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'll start rambling. So where, where well, we that's, at? Was that's, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good background as far as, um, I just wanted to hear kind of how in it you were, you know, and it sounds pretty like, in it. <clears throat> and it sounds like that was your worldview. That was, yeah. that's how you saw the world. And that's what was passed on to you by your parents. And that was something yep. you internalized. So how old were you when you, when you started to ask questions that you felt like were actual splinters, like, okay, what's going on here? Like, um, I, that's, I haven't really thought about when I started. Cause I've always been someone who asked questions, um, and I was always somebody who in church, the pastor, we would be talking about a certain book, the Bible, and I would have like a study Bible and I would be reading all the notes and I would read things like, well, this uh, writing's attributed to Paul, but we're not sure who really wrote that. And I'm, and I'm like, I'm like, that's interesting that no one talks about that, but I didn't ha really ask anybody. Um, right. And I don't know if I just felt I didn't really feel that I would get a good answer. Um, right. I may have asked my parents, but it may have got blown off or or told like, well, this is the way this is what we believe. And and because um, it, was, it was like with, with my parents, it was like we have the understanding. You're the kid and we will now we will teach you you're wrong and we're going to teach you, you know, how to be right and how to read for yourself. So I was pretty like I had a lot of Bible knowledge at a young age and but for me to always kind of open more questions so i, I would say probably as far as <laughs> questions go like maybe junior high yeah I not think. just questions but like questions that tangibly made you rethink your holistic worldview and walking away from that that didn't happen until i was probably uh maybe late 20s early 30s probably because I had kind of, well, I take that back, probably my 20s, because I remember um, living in Tulsa, and we would go to coffee shops, and and we were always like the renegade Christians. So I always, I always you know, liked like Rich Mullins, um, Page of the Lion at the time, all like, you know, Christian hardcore, all the, all the Christian punk bands. Those are the kind of artists, those are the kind of people that I surrounded myself Right. with and all of us were kind of already you know truth seekers in a sense um so i so though that was the a time where, where i had moved away from my parents i'd got done with co college in during college i didn't care i didn't matter you know right. i wanted to know i had to get my work done for school work done i had a job uh and you know uh where's the nearest where's the next party and you know where's the cute girls that I can try to get to know that's religion right. and all that was not on my mind during that time. But so it wasn't until I kind of got off on my own and then went to a place like Tulsa where they had, you had different variations of Christianity where I was able to kind of meet some friends who were artists and into, into band all in band. Everyone was in a band that I was hanging out with. And we were able to kind of like, kind of, almost form our own like theology in a sense and i remember you know st standing outside a coffee shop smoking a clove cigarette <clears throat> with my friends who smoked uh and uh because i don't like regular i don't like real cigarettes and cloves tasted good so i was like i want to smoke a clove cigarette and they're black so they look cool but they they don't smell manly or anything i guess if you're gonna put that label on it but they look go. cool they're black that's your speed so we would have like conversations about how, you know, the mainstream church, you know, how I was, I would always say, you know, when Jesus comes back, he's going to be like, what the hell are you guys doing? Like you misinterpreted everything that I said and you like formed this like corporate thing. I remember I, I would say stuff like that. And um, so I think my twenties is when I was kind of really starting to work that out with, uh, with friends and we just shooting the shit and, and, but it wasn't like, I didn't I was just kind of, I'm almost very much like how I am now at that time. Cause I didn't, I wasn't thinking about it too hard. I didn't have the pressure on me, um, to think about it, talk about it. I would go to church. We'd have a cool worship time. We'd feel connected to God, go about our day and, you know, talk about this kind of stuff. But then, you know, we just wanted to go hang out in a garage and 
you know, play music and talk, you know, watch movies and stuff like that. And of course I'd, I had a job too. So I was just kind of this, you know, 20 in my twenties, single in, in my twenties. And it wasn't really until I, I met my wife and, um, <clears throat> moved out back out to Southern California and got involved in like, we got, you know, having a baby and getting involved with her family and her family wants us to go to their church and getting involved in their church. That's when I kind of reconnected, got plugged back in. And that's when I was really trying, you know, I would, was trying to do better, trying to be a better Christian and then working for that Christian company. So it's like, I reverted. I almost went, kind of got plugged back into the whole system and, mm-hmm. and really believed it and really wanted to do better. My wife and I talked about tongues and, you know, all this stuff, you know, um, that the church would happen at church. And I would always kind of butt heads about the prosperity stuff and the tongue stuff. But we, we would have good conversations and, you know, but I didn't. But I suddenly I had this pressure that I had to be a certain way at church as we were getting more involved with the church. Our, you know, our daughter, when she was a baby, they wanted to, you know how the pastors pray over the baby and and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, so by the, so I've, I never like, so there was never a tumultuous, you know, time as far as religion goes, it was there. Uh, I was a sinner. I needed to repent. And those were, you know, there's ups and downs with that sort of stuff, like feeling shame, um, certain shame, um, about sexuality and things like that. And I thought that all that was normal. So yeah. going through my twenties, I kind of didn't think about that. I had no gay friends or anything. And, um, and then, in, and then once I got into my thirties, I'm a dad, I'm married, I'm a dad. I kind of had this expectation on me that I need, I need to raise my kids a certain way. Um, and I was really trying. And then my brother-in-law died and then I that it kind of brought back all the questioning and all the kind of conversations I'd had in my 20s and I really you know the linchpin I think <clears throat> when it finally when I was finally like you know I'm done with all this um was there was a um Jay Baker was talking because I was listening to Jay, ba- Jay, Jay Baker's um sermons every Sunday or driving to work and he was talking about um, gay marriage because all, at that time, the whole gay marriage conversation was everywhere. And, you know, California had approved gay marriage and then they rolled back gay marriage. And then so this whole always on this conversation, all this conversation going on. And of course, churches are praying against it. And um, and Jay Baker was talking about, you know, uh, LGBTQ things and, and how he was no longer going to hide revolution um he was going to come out and just be a gay affirming church and so he had visited a gay affirming church um somewhere it was called open door in georgia i think or somewhere and he'd come back from that all kind of jazzed up about it and he became a you know we're a gay affirming church this is a this is very important and when i heard that it was like a light bulb went off my head like you know why isn't the church more opening to everyone? Like, why is it this exclusive club? Like, why do you have to <clears throat> like repent and change when there's nothing to change? <clears throat> and once I started kind of then, so then the way that I am is all start studying something like till, it, you know, t- till I'm just done with it and they move on. Mm-hmm. So I started studying on, you know, what the Bible has to say about, you know, homosexuality and and all that kind of stuff which and it turns out especially especially the new testament not a whole lot so i started studying all this stuff and reaching out to some more liberal um christian friends and talking to them and um and so that was really when things started kind of the wall started i guess kind of closing in on me right because um because i was like well that's a no-brainer i've done all, i've done all this research and I was out, um, I was hanging out, there's a band called Spoken that I used to tour with and they were coming through, or the singer, Matt, um, Matt Bard was coming through Southern California at a Christian tattoo place. And I was talking to him and I was like, yeah, I was like, well, I was like, I'm, I'm, a, I've come to the conclusion that uh, I'm gay affirming. Like I'm a gay affirming Christian. I, I think, you know, gay marriage is all right. And, you know. They're free to live their lives and I don't have, I have nothing to say, you know, why would 
I tell them how to live their life. And he didn't say much. He kind of went, huh, interesting. And then that was it. And I was like, and I, and I, and I was thinking like, especially from someone like him, cause we'd had, we'd, we toured a lot. And, um, I used to be like a stage manager and a tour manager for some bands. And, um, but there's no more dialogue. It was like the, the conversation went thunk and went nowhere. And, um, and then I was like, well, and I think I just got Facebook and I was like, I'm going to put it out there. I'm gay firming. So I'm pro gay marriage. And, and, you know, I think, I don't think God, you know, I think I'm a gay firming Christian and I put that out there and it was like everyone and their mother was sending me private messages, emails, like, are you okay? How could you call yourself a Christian and, and be pro gay marriage? And, and it was odd to me because my understanding of Jesus from being raised Christian, uh, it was like my understanding of Jesus was at odds with all these other Christians, like everyone, like everyone that I knew when I was a church going, you know, young adult, uh, kid, young adult, all those people for like from Iowa. Um, funny, funnily enough, my Tulsa friends, everyone was, everyone got it because we all actually started kind of in one, one point or another having these conversations again. Um, but like, but they're not out in the open like me. Right. <laughs> so I kind of opened up Pandora's box and then through a series, like a couple of weeks of just being bombarded. And um, I was like, I don't, I was like, I don't know what I think. I don't know what I am. Is this, if, because I was like, if this is Christianity and they can't even accept a gay married couple into church or even accept the fact that they're married. I'm like, what are we even doing, you know, as, as a religion? So in 2012, long, we're a long way around back to 2012. That's when I started my podcast to kind of at least like get it out there that here's the reasons why I don't know what I believe right now and why I'm considering hmm. kind of leaving this thing called Christianity. And then, uh, <clears throat> so then that, that that's the start of that. And there's no word for it, you know? Right. I mean, there was no, you mean there was no <clears throat> instruction term at the time? There was no term. No one was um, talking about it publicly. Everyone was kind of deconstructing silently. And because um, it was either you're atheist or you're Christian, because there's all these atheist podcasts, like, right. you know, Seth Andrews, you know, the Thinking Atheist podcast. I, man, I devoured his podcast um and then i found a few others and i started listening to because i had a long drive i commuted so at this time i was working for um uh, public right. utility and so i was commuting so man i like 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 with what i did about learning about you know lgbtq rights and all this kind of stuff um and, and the church and i started kind of like just finding as much information as i can i found there was these Yale um, Bible classes about like how um, the New Testament was written. And um, I devoured I devoured that entire class in like a week. And they're like videos, they're YouTube videos. And so I would basically, I found a way to download them, rip them, because you, you can stream on your phone at the time. Yeah, I ripped them all into um, some player and I would listen to them as I was driving. And it was like my, I, like, uh, I would make MP3s out of them or I can't remember. I somehow had them playing. Maybe, maybe I had an iPhone at the time. It may, was the iPhone out in 2012? Maybe. Yes. Okay. So I, uh, anyway, I'm sweating in my booth. Um, so I started devouring all this stuff and then I found another class lectures on, on the old Testament and that blew my mind, uh, just i'm like this is stuff i've never heard of that no one ever talks about that's like super fascinating even whether you're a christian or not like the story of how the bible was put together is fascinating so i was listening to all those a couple of my atheist friends hit me up and were like hey man are you joining our side <laughs> 
and they were friends. I didn't know they're atheists. Like I was like, wait, you're an atheist? And he's like, yeah, man, I've been an atheist for like three years, you know? Um, <laughs> so they started coming out of the woodwork site, like through like, you know, emails and phone calls and text messages. And then a buddy of mine, Joe, his name is Joey. And he decided to become my, my co-host because he was in a Christian band when I was touring doing the stage managing. And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, I'm agnostic. He's like, I don't care. He's like, but yeah, I've been going through this. And so we connected. Then he started kind of co-hosting. And so then slowly I started like finding people that I could talk to. And I was like, well, that's interesting. When we talk this stuff out, like it's actually very, very, very helpful. Because I thought I was going crazy. I, I was holding all this in. I couldn't talk to anybody. I couldn't talk to my wife uh, because she was, you know, she was going to church. She loves church. She loves worship. She get emotional during church. And any time I would ask any sort of challenging question, um, it would lead to a fight. And I was like, well, I don't, you know, and I heard, and I heard about, you know, my atheist friends were like, yeah, I'm divorced now, <laughs> you know? And I was like, well, I don't want to get divorced. Um, I just had, you know, we had just had kid number two, I think. And so I had two kids and I was just like, you know, I know I love my wife. I was like, why would we get divorced over just like religious views? You know, I'm like, we can coexist, you know? So, um, so yeah, so we, it was, it, it, the whole conversation at home, it, it made it, it was just awful. I couldn't talk to anybody. I couldn't talk to my in-laws, you know, I still can't talk to them about this stuff. Yeah. Um, so people started coming out of the woodwork. So I was able to kind of start you know, talking to them about all this and disagreeing and um, having, you know, spirited debate about about certain things. So, um, so it seemed it seemed kind of like progressive for you over yeah. a long period of time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, I, I when I started the podcast, I knew I was done with Christianity. So in 2012, after my brother in law passed away after the whole gay marriage conversation, I was like, this is not for me anymore. And I didn't know, I didn't know how to classify myself. I, I mean, but I was like, whether or not I say it publicly, like I knew it, it was done. And my idea was to burn it all down. Um, and it's, it's, it's funny. It is deconstruction. It, I was like, and I, I'll explain. I'm like, well, it's like, you know, it's like you built a house and the house, you know, you want to kind of figure out what's going on and you want to start over. You break, you, you bulldoze the house. I'm like, that's what I'm doing with, with religion. I'm burning it all to the ground. And I, it's funny that I didn't You're say an innovator, man. I'm an innovator. I don't know. <laughs> but see, it's just finally someone coined a term. Uh, yeah. Too bad. I didn't think of exvangelical, but yeah. Right. Um, so, so yeah, so I burned my idea was like, I'm gonna burn it all down and, I'm finally, for the first time in my life, going to rebuild what I believe on my terms and not on the terms of a pastor, not on the terms of, of a father figure or parent or whatever on my terms, because guess what? I'm a, I'm a parent and I, you know, there's all this expectation on me to lay down some foundation on them. I was like, why would I lay a foundation down on my kids? That's just some bullshit I heard from someone else. You know, and I, I'm just believing it because I'm supposed to, so I can get to the golden, you know, golden city, <laughs> right. you know, so, so yeah, so that was the start of me, you know, deconstructing it all, getting it all down. So I, I was like, there's just so much baggage in the current state of Christianity that even at that time. And I feel, I feel like now it's gotten even more complicated right. um, that I, ha I had to, or else I was going to get divorced and lose my mind and you know, have a nervous breakdown and just say, fuck it. I'm an atheist. Um, and, and just be like, and just move on with my life. But um, I found that over years of, you know, years and years of like, conversations, many, many podcasts of conversations, just meeting people. And it's like, I didn't want to be done with Christianity and I still don't, I, I, and that's the weird place that I'm at now is, is like, I feel like the teachings of Jesus have a lot of 
there, there's a lot there. It's simple, and there's a lot of value to what Jesus yeah. taught. And there's a lot of progressive and liberal values that Jesus taught. And, and I feel like that's worth salvaging because for me, Jesus is his ideas can match up with like Buddhist philosophy can match up with, you know, other, other teachers. And, you know, that's, that's worth salvaging. I, I don't know if Christianity is worth salvaging, but yeah, you know, for me now it's like it, it, Christianity can be a tool to teach us about, you know, Jesus and, yeah. and why he, he was saying these things if he even yeah. existed. <laughs> Yeah. Other conversation. Yeah. Well, I think what always comes to my mind is like, as I process my journey and my story, I look back and I'm like, what was the why behind why I was motivated in those spaces? Like what, what kept me there? What, mm -hmm. what was pushing me in that direction? And it's, it's interesting because I think it's really simple. I think, I think it's fear. I think yeah. um, the idea that I'm going to die someday is hard to process. Yes. Um, and so I think in a less conscious state to have a clear answer, um, it brings a lot of psychological comfort to people. And well, I, I think it's, it's, um, it's that black and whiteness that draws people in and i yeah. can say like as i self-reflect like a big thing for me has been therapy because i've been able to dig in and like see what my motivations really are mm -hmm. um and that's opened up a lot of boxes for me i didn't expect to open um i blame a lot of therapy for my deconstruction <laughs> um but I think there's just a lot tied to to that fear, but it works on the atheist side too. Yeah, because, totally. Because they're compensating for something a lot of times as well. It's no yeah. different. It's just the inverse. And it's interesting because as I've started posting deconstruction content, the automatic assumption is that's what I am now. Yeah. Right? Um, and it's interesting. I did a, a episode with Phil Drysdale. Um, have you listened to him or looked at his content at all? I don't. The name sounds familiar, but I don't think I have. So he's done some fascinating work on this thing called spiral dynamics, and it's basically okay. it's basically um, at large social psychology. And one of the things that he that that these psychologists and scientists have discovered is that human consciousness is basically progressive on a societal scale. So like you go back to biblical times, the way that they viewed the outcomes of a war was that mm -hmm. if they lost, they were sinning and God was mad yeah. at them. Right. So the outcome of these wars basically told them, you know, whether they were in the right or not. Um, and so it's just very primitive thinking. And then, you know, yeah. as society matures, you know, you stop seeing it in those simplistic terms. Well, this whole concept of spiral dynamics basically says that, like, from a psychological standpoint, there is a stage in which we need black and whiteness, like to cope and make sense of life and, and grow and develop just like a, you know, a two year old needs to act like a two year old for a certain mm -hmm. amount of time until they grow out of that phase. Um, and so, so something that I've processed a lot as I've been on this side is we like the comfort of religion or atheism or, or whatever it is, whatever your circle is, there's a time in our life when we need that. Yeah. Um, but then there's the next phase after that is a very individualistic phase, which you're talking about. It's like, no, I need to determine what I need for me. Like, I, I need to figure out what I think about this. And so it's kind of like this journey off into the wilderness that's really scary. Um, but it's just part of it's part of it's part of the development of mm -hmm. of humanity. 
And what's interesting is everybody in the tribe that you're leaving thinks you're backtracking, but you're really growing and becoming, you're having a greater capacity for love, compassion. Mm -hmm. um, and so in a sense, one thing that you've said to me that really resonates is like, I feel more in alignment with Jesus now than I did before. Yeah. And the parallels are like, <clears throat> hey, being rejected by the tribe, like mm -hmm. crucified, um, you know, pissing people off all the time because I'm not falling in line for what the religious, um, you know, the religious people want from me. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting because the people who authored the, the spiral dynamic studies, they they're not religious at all. But in their study of the psychology of Jesus, he was like on one of the highest scales of like human consciousness that they can contrive of, like his capacity to see other people in their stage and accept mm -hmm. them where they are um, was just off the charts. And, and Buddha was there, too. Like there's yeah. there's just a lot of people. But I think the main thing I'm trying to get at and, and bringing all that up is that I think the one thing that keeps us in that circle is fear of hell and yes. fear of not knowing what happens when we die. And yeah. so once we hit a point in our journey where we don't have to have the black and white answers anymore, psychologically, that's when we kind of fall off the deep end, I think, and mm -hmm. start kind of deconstructing. And so for a lot of us, it's yep. pain. For me, it was divorce. Um, sounds like for you, it was, you know, the loss of a loved one you'll force that was, you into that space. Right. That was definitely, that was the catalyst to push me where a direction I was already going, but it definitely was the thing that kind of fast tracked it. You know, I mean, I should have been, the thing is talking about the spiral dynamics and stuff. Like I should have been kind of thinking about all this and had a safe place to talk about all this, you know, in, in my twenties, you right. know, or, or more my late teens but I didn't have, I didn't feel like I had a safe place, even though in my twenties, I was kind of, you know, doing my own thing. The conversations only go so far. Well, you, you still believe in Jesus, right? You're still saved, right? Oh yeah, I'm saved. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to heaven. There, there, there was no, right. even with the conversations that, that kind of like, you know, skirted the line of like, you know, maybe agnostic, maybe we would never go all the way there because at the end of the day, we were just more kind of like, <clears throat> like, hippie Christians, <laughs> you know? Um, but there was, we hadn't, but we weren't politically involved uh, yet enough to really kind of see this other big picture where politics and religion collide. And I think right. me being older and starting to see that and then going through a tragedy really pushed me into this because I was seeing a, a collision of culture, politics, culture, and religion with the, with the gay marriage thing. And the, too and you know it's bizarre that how much politics can get wrapped or how much religion has gotten wrapped into politics and i think that was i know it's always kind of been there i know in the 50s it was there i know that it's been a thing you know throughout the 90s um you know with censorship or the the parental virus advisory labels you have D.D. Snyder talking about, you know, censorship and stuff like that. Um, it's always been there, but I guess I had to get to a place where I saw it for myself and I guess was mature enough to actually be able to kind of have dialogues about it and stand up for like what I believed. Because, yeah, yeah but, but I didn't because there was always that fear of hell. Like if I'm on the wrong side, I'm going to hell, right. you know, so I better not even entertain I better I can I can I can step up to the edge, but I'm not going to go that far because I still want to go to heaven. I don't want to burn for eternity in this in this lake of fire. Right. Who wants that? <laughs> Who wants that? I mean, nobody wants that, you know. But um, so I started, yeah. yeah so I, I started pulling, you know, I burned it all down and started pulling at the thread of like belief, you know, of what what and and I kind of by burning it all down like that you're able to kind of look at how you were raised, um, the religion you were raised in through a different light because you're no longer an active participant. You're watching from the outside and you're able to kind of view the cracks, you know, 
mm. in, in the flaws in, in those in those conversations. Right. And but but man, oh man, I remember like me and my wife almost got a divorce over all this because it was Easter and I think I've been doing my podcast a couple of years. It's funny, her, her and I are very much on the same page now, but I w- at the time I was like, I'm not trying to pull her to my side. I'm not, you know, I didn't want to even go there. I would like kind of talk about what I'm reading and stuff like that, but I was like, I'm not going to like try to change her mind because it was, it's, you know, that's useless. Um, Cause then she's just doing what I tell her to do or whatever, which is, I didn't want that. She never would anyway. <laughs> anyway, so it's Easter. Uh, and we're talking about, she's been seeing, she knows that I've been I'm questioning things and she's like, well, you believe in the resurrection though, right? I mean, yeah, you know, gay marriage and yeah, you know, but I mean, you believe in the resurrection. And I went, no. <laughs> I was like, I don't, I was like, you know, and <clears throat> me just saying no, the look in her eyes was like, I'll never forget how she looked at me because she almost couldn't process it. Like how, like, I mean, that means like, I'm, I'm assuming she's thinking, well, that means you're going to hell. You don't believe in the, like, that's the one thing we have to believe in is the resurrection. Um, Right. And I was like, well, no, I was like, I, I, I look at the resurrection as Jesus's message getting out there. That was the linchpin, the catalyst to, for the disciples to start spreading the message, the good news, um, which the church messed up because the good news was God loves you. <laughs> That's it. Literally it. Right. Um, and and that is the res was the res and my and my understanding I was like well that's the resurrection, it's not a physical manifestation it's not zombie Jesus it's not you know. And so I, I was telling her this and and <clears throat> it turned it turned into like one of those marital knockdown drag out fights that we were up way too late, just right. you know, and and of course those kind of arguments it's like they they never go they never end well because it's like you start want to defend yourself and you say the wrong thing and then you're already you've already stepped in it so it's like i mean that was almost the end of our marriage <clears throat> but um luckily she stayed around <laughs> yeah that's a hard conversation so how how did that progress from there <clears throat> well <clears throat> she um when we it took her, it took her some, I mean, we were like not talking <laughs> for a bit, but what she told me was when we finally had a conversation about it and kind of, um, she said, well, she goes, I know she said, I realize that you're going through all this. She goes, but the one thing that I know is that I love you. And I see, she, she said, the, and I know you love me back and I know you love our kids. And she's like, that for me is worth fighting for more than if we see, if we're on the same page with religion. Wow. That's and wild. and that kind of turned things around for her. But I mean, but not a lot of people that, that doesn't happen to many people. I mean, usually yeah. that kind of fight, that's it. And I was I was like getting ready to figure out like where I was gonna live. I was like, man, it's over. It's over. There's no way we're coming back from that. Cause we are just not on the same page. Cause the church the church teaches that not to be unequally yoked. It's, it's this big thing. Like if you're not on the same level, cause you can't build that foundation for your kids, you know? Um, but, but also the church also frowns on divorce. So I don't know, <laughs> but yeah. I mean, I figured it was over, but her and I had to talk and, and that, and that conversation, when she let me know that it's, you know what, you go on your journey and she, and she gave me the permission to go on that journey to explore um, that right there was when I fir- I felt freedom for the first time in a long time because I had been keeping, you know, these feelings in this conversation in because I knew she didn't want to hear it. And I knew that every time I would bring something up, you know, that, that was the whole reason why I would never say anything was because I knew we would have a fight about it. 
But once she gave me the permission, it changed our whole relationship, it changed our whole marriage dynamic. Um, I, you know, I can, if she, she would, I would only say something if she asked me. And that was kind of the rules. I was like, I'm not just going to dump you with a bunch of stuff I'm learning because we're just not on the same page with that. But if you have questions, you know, like if we're having a, having a beer or whatever, and you want to, you want to talk about it. Great. I was like, I, I'll, I put the ball in her court with those types of conversations. And then, and you know, we kind of went from there. So, but, uh, but yeah, that was, that was a, that was a very, very, very crazy time. But yeah. I mean, so now as a parent, I kind of, I take that, that kind of, um, mindset too. I want to allow my kids to go through this journey themselves and learn on their own. I want to be yeah. there to engage conversation, but not to force them into believing a certain thing because I don't think that's my role as a parent. My role as a parent is to prepare them for the real world and how to survive yeah. in the real world and engage in people, um, not how to believe. Right. That's what, yeah. So so that's, I guess that's yeah. the point of that. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I think that I think there's a lot of emphasis on that. Like, I think that's the biggest problem with Christianity being on the other side is that the entire premise is what you believe and believing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And when you're in it, it seems so compelling because it's built on this foundation of, you know, faith versus works. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's compelling, you know, from a grace standpoint that, you know, when you're looking at it from the standpoint of like an even more fundamentalist Christianity, it's a relief to go into that, you know, grace centered theology that a lot of us kind of moved into before we deconstructed. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think, no, I, I think that, I think that's the biggest part of it is, like like you experienced with your your wife um there's just so much social pressure mm -hmm. in those circles that <clears throat> perpetuates that loop and you, yeah. you're, st you're stuck in it until something traumatic enough makes you see it from that outside perspective and you're free to ask the questions and then once you're on the outside um, it's not like you abandon the whole thing. I think I resonate a lot with where you are too. Um, I look forward to talking about this more in the future, but it's, it's more a matter of, okay, what am I going to walk away from this with? And what am I going to leave behind? Yeah. Um, and having yeah. the freedom to do that and, being okay with not having all the answers because the reality yeah. is we don't, we don't have all the answers. And the idea that we do is just, it's just a psychological crutch. We don't, we don't know, like, no. um, and so there's a humility. <clears throat> there's a humility that I think a lot of people on the inside Christianity don't respect about people deconstructing mm -hmm. um, that. I think if Jesus were here today, he would be connecting with that. He, Jesus would be going on the emo cruise, Russ. <laughs> He'd be joining us on the emo cruise. Hell yeah, he would. <laughs> but that's the thing, like, and that's what I feel like a lot of people miss in 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 America. I, I would I would say American or fundamentalist Christianity because there's so many different denominations. I know so many great. Um, we haven't even got to the gay church that freaking saved my, saved me, man. That was oh my god. They literally a, a gay church literally saved Christianity for me and 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 helped me look at it at a different perspective. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. I don't know how much time we have left, but yeah. Um, but but the the fundamentalist you know area, right? Like, I don't know how they've missed the mark of Jesus so bad because there was there was a TV show um, about Jesus where they hired the right you know ethnicity of actors. Um, oh gosh, what's it called? The Chosen? Is it called The Chosen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really, really well done. And, but, but I see like my fundamentalist friends and family, like, oh, we watched The Chosen and it's all so good. I'm like, 
Well, did Jesus tell a gay person to, they got to get everything right before they hang out? Did he tell someone to sober up before he talked to them? Did he tell someone to stop cheating on their spouse or stop doing this before he'd have a conversation with them? I'm like, no, like literally they have these examples of, of the message of Jesus right in front of them. And they all, everyone nods and that's so great. But once they step out of the church, and sometimes it's it's even the shit's even come from the pulpit, you know, the pastor doesn't even get it. But but once they but they don't follow any of that in their daily lives, you know, in this in this in in the Christianity that we see on the Fox News and and all that. And and like I said, I don't want to generalize Christianity because Christianity is a huge umbrella. Unfortunately, I think that the term Christianity has been tainted with this this group you know that has you know their access to the you know creating their own tv shows and their own music and their own books and they, it's just the huge bubble this manufactured christianity that has kind of come up you know th- through the the 80s and the 90s um it's just this capitalist christianity in a sense where it's their own infrastructure, their own, like, yeah. uh, their own, uh, what's the word I'm using? I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, like Apple has their own, uh, you know, anyway, I don't know. <laughs> it's a, it's the stupidest, simplest term. I can't think of it right now, but, um, they're all, they're all stuck in their own, their own system, you know, almost like their own money, their own, everything, their own infrastructure. Right. But, um, the words on the tip of my tongue and I can't think. Anymore. Yeah. I, I mean, I think just like anything else, people project their concept onto Jesus and they see what they want to see. And maybe that's what I'm doing. <laughs> I mean, maybe that's what we're all doing. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Part of my process too was universalism and starting to get into that. Mm-hmm. And what that really opened my eyes up to is that universalism was widely accepted by like, orthodox denominations in early christianity yeah it's it's been completely demonized over the last four or five hundred years but i read through um there's a guy named robin perry who's like a reformed universalist and he was so scared to write on it at first that he like wrote under a pseudonym (laughs) um and like george mcdonald was his name but the book's incredible. He he goes through and he basically says, look, I'm not trying to convince you to become a universalist. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm just saying this is a tenable view if you want to still embrace Christianity. But what that book did for me is it made me say, okay, wait a second. How I interpret this is highly dependent on what I start with and mm-hmm. my own like preconceived perspective of it. Because I can make sense. That book made a good point that I can make sense of the Arminian view if I start with these texts. I can make sense of a Calvinist view if I start with these texts. And I can make sense of a Universalist view if I start with these texts. And they all sound just as reasonable if you can look at it from a third person perspective and then, you know, put yourself in the shoes of that person. And so once you start going down that rabbit hole, it's like, okay. There's been over 20,000 denominations in Christianity. How arrogant is it for me to stake my claim on one and think I have it figured out? Yeah. And no matter which one you're a part of, the paradigm is the same. We have the premium on truth that gets us most sanctified and saves us. Mm -hmm. Right. And it doesn't matter which one, unless you're more progressive. But in the circles I was in, it was much more black and white. Yeah. So, um, you know, coming out of that, you just you you kind of see it for what it is. And and the blinders just come off. It's like I can make sense of this from a lot of different perspectives. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, So I don't really know where I was going with that. This is why I write a script. (laughs) (laughs) You're with me, man. There's no scripts. Yeah. You, can, you, you can tell by the way I kind of go all over the place. Yeah. But no, I mean, you, you're you're exactly right when you say, you know, how arrogant is it, you know, that one person is staking the claim on on the truth because you know, um, 
I think there's so many examples of that not being the case. Just the the history of the church itself. If you want to start like <clears throat> like if you want to explore re- any sort of religion, like instead of just like reading, instead of like starting with like say like you say a prayer, you go up and you say a prayer and you accept Jesus, right? Like if they were to give me like a church history book, here, study up on the church. <laughs> study up on like how this book was put together. Um, man, they of course would have less followers instead of like, here, start with the book of John. Here's a little thing and read this and God oh, loves you and you're on the team now. Congratulations. <laughs> See you in church next Sunday. Next yeah. Sunday, we're talking about tithes and you better get plugged into a small group, you know, like all that stuff. Like if I would have started learning about like church history with my personality and I might have stayed, <laughs> I might have stayed unless I kind of learned, learned everything. And then if everyone was like, Hey, well, we don't know it all, but man, that Jesus guy, right? <laughs> right. You know, that's because that's, that's supposed to be, that's supposed to be the, the common denominator in Christianity is Christ. He's in the name of the religion. And I, his message is so simple. His message, his message was, um, love others as you love yourself. It was like, that was like the only commandment was love that he gave, um, attributed to him. But I don't understand how Christianity has tried to like, you know, have, have the one saying it all. Uh, it's this America, this fundamentalist Christianity, Right. And get it plugged into the schools, into the into the politics, and right. um, and and just create such a frenzy every single day. Um, it's just it's it's just it's a it's distracting. It's a distraction when ultimately we really should be kind to each other. Your neighbor's hungry, feed them a meal. You know they need clothes, give them some clothes. Someone needs money, help them out as a community, right? Like that's for me like that was the gospel message it got lost it was supposed to be we're on this planet we're humans let's take care of each other yeah. no matter like no matter what we believe because we're all we we all share in humanity right and and that's i, I think i guess you know, all the way around like, that's kind of where i'm at now is like that's if the, the the little ounce of christianity in me like that's it that is it's it it's simple you know do i Make mistakes every day? Yes. Am I, an ass- am I an asshole sometimes? Yes. Do I fall short every day? Yeah. But at the end of the day, I love I love people and I would I want to do better. I want to do better tomorrow. You know, right. that's that's all we can do. Yeah. But before we wrap up, do you have a, like is it gonna shut off or anything? Or no, it's not gonna shut off. Let's go for like five to ten more minutes on call. I, got, I just wanna kind of this last little piece of the puzzle. Um because I was literally on my way to just being like, I'm agnostic, I'm atheist, fuck religion, fuck God, ah, you know. Um, and I, I need to go back and listen to my my podcast episodes to kind of see the, the kind of the roller coaster ride that I was on. Yeah. Because for, for I was literally going to be like, I am just, I'm going to join the atheist team and just be that. Um, but then I was driving home from, a, I, I used to work IT, so I was, dri- I was at another office driving home through a city called Brea, and Brea, California, and I saw this sign with a gay flag on it that said, all are welcome in front of this little church. I was like, oh my God, I guess that's amazing, because I had, I had heard about affirming churches, you know, um, I knew about Revolution Church and stuff, but I'd never seen one myself. And they had the sign on a busy street right, right outside their church, all are welcome. And it was uh, the uh, UCC Church of Brea, um, United Church of Christ in Brea. And I pulled my car over. I took a picture of the sign. I found the church on Facebook. I um, immediately, like as soon as I got home, like <laughs> I rushed to my computer. And I was like, I have this podcast. I've walked away from Christianity, but I'm kind of like, you know, forming it all, like doing this podcast and talking to people. I go, would, can I come to your church and interview the pastor and, and some of the people, you know, uh, in the church? And they're like, yeah, that'd be great. 
you want to come to Sunday school? I was like, I'll come to Sunday school. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I was like, oh, okay. You know, I was like, I brought all my recording equipment and, and I went in and, um, small church, like five people in the Sunday school. And I think other than, well, I was one of the few straight people at, the church, at that church when I went, when I arrived, but I go, I sit in the Sunday school class and it's, and it's this really intellectual conversation. They were watching a video uh, uh, with John Dominic Crossan, I think, mm-hmm. uh, about hell, about like the existence of hell and does it exist or not or whatever. And I was blown away that I can be like, yeah, I'm agnostic, but I'm coming to your Sunday school. And they're like, oh, great. And let's talk about hell. OK. And we were able to have this really intellectual, philosophical conversation. It was just conversation. It wasn't Sunday school. It was like I was a part of a conversation. Me, this guy who's never met any of these people. I'm able to bring my experience to the table and just freely talk about my doubts, my frustrations and whether or not I believed in hell. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. I, I was elated when Sunday school ended. And then I go to the church service. I meet the youth pastor and his husband and I'm like, then I meet uh, someone else and her wife, you know, and I was just like, and they all just, they all loved being there. They loved Jesus. Like they're like, they love God. Like they weren't pretending to be like, they were Christians, man. Like it was incredible. Yeah. Uh, and I went to the church, kind of, it was a stale church service. It was like, sit up, sit down. We'll do a reading, reading together. Very, very Lutheran, very, I don't know the term of that, that kind of church service, but very traditional. Like high church. Yeah. But it, but I didn't, I didn't care, which was weird. Cause I'd always wanted to go to the church with like, you know, I wanted to go see Michael Gunger perform worship. I went to Michael Gunger's church for a while. You <laughs> interviewed Michael, him. Michael Gunger right? worship. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, we'll talk about him later. I got uh, where he's at now. I'm like, I got, I got opinions, <laughs> but, um, uh, so, so I'm in this church and, and I'm like, it was incredible. I didn't care that it was stale. I didn't care that it was kind of boring, but people just loved being, they, they loved gathering together and being together. And, and ultimately like, and here's, and here's the thing, like, cause I was always taught like, well, if you're not, if you're not straight, if you're not this, you're not that, you can't be a real Christian, you know, because that's how I was raised. That's what I was always in the back of my head. And here I was in this, in this church with people professing to be Christians that weren't supposed to be professed to be Christians if they went to my you know church that I was raised in. And that was really uh, humbling for me to think about. And then I, I interviewed them afterwards. And then they, then they said, after the interview, which uh, went amazing. And a few of the congregants, the youth pastor, the pastor and associate pastor and wonderful conversation. It's still up there. I'm keeping my podcast up there forever. Someday I might start it again, but um, it really kind of brought me back down and I was like, wow, there are, this exists in the world and it's a good thing. Like this is a, this church service is so good for these people because they're able to be in community with each other. They're able to worship together. And, and, and then then they had a potluck after. You're covered the potluck, right? I've never felt so welcomed in a church ever than I was at that little church. And the 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 connections I made on that one Sunday, I'm still friends with those people today. Which is insane. I was there for three hours. Um, so this little uh so I always tell me, like, they're like, Sean, like, how did you find God again? I'm like, the gays, the gays <laughs> brought me back to God. When was that, Sean? <laughs> that was, I'm looking, I'm like, I have my podcast seasons up. Was that season? Uh, I want to say it was like 2014. It was only a few, two or three years later. And because I think it was like 2014, something like that. Anyway, so two years after I started the podcast, um, 
but I've never forgot that. That that moment has always stuck with me. When so when someone starts slamming all of Christianity, I'm like, mm, you can't because there is there is a safe place where a lot of you know LGBTQ Christians can meet and worship and and pursue what they believe is truth, what they feel is truth in a safe place, and that's important. So. Mm. Yeah, so then I, I got involved in a small little UCC near us for a, a little bit um, until the pastor yeah. left. She was awesome. But yeah. Well, there's a lot to unpack. Yeah. All of that. <laughs> there's a lot of good stuff. But um, how? so how did you burn it down and walk away? How did I burn it down and walk away? I... I... I, I woke up and I said, I literally was like, I don't believe this anymore. Back in 2012. Mm -hmm. I don't believe this anymore. And you know what, whatever, what I find on my journey, I'm going to keep the things that stick. I'm going to slowly and slowly keep the few things that resonate with me. Um, and so, holy crap, 10 years later. Wow. Yeah. 10 years later. You know, I have, uh, I have, I have the, I have the porch rebuilt. <laughs> yeah. You know, so looking back on that, I'm sure you're incredibly glad that you let yourself go to that place. <clears throat> I think, I, I think everyone, if you're a free thinking, free thinking person, someone who really likes to challenge yourself and, and think things through, I think it's important it's something I think it's something that everyone should do at some point. And it's something that I encourage. I'm encouraging my kids right now as they're teenagers to do that very same thing. I'm like, you know, it doesn't matter what, you know, your grandparents tell you, friends and their parents tell you, if you go to a certain church, what they tell you, because they, they'll go to their friends' youth groups. So I keep telling them, you need to find this stuff out on your own. And we're here to engage in conversation and to show you where to read things yourself. But if you're not figuring this stuff out for yourself, then, you know, for me, it's like, well, what's the point? I can't live with myself to just believe what someone else is telling me. I got to, you know, yeah, I, I got to take it apart. <laughs> yeah. And you're creating a safe space for them to do that. Yeah. Where they can bounce it off the wall. Yep. And hopefully they're friends. It's funny. Um all of their friends love us. They all like we're the safe we're the we're this uh, we're the safe place for their friends to come and hang out, mm -hmm. and that feels really good. You That's know, great, so. man. I'm doing something right. Yeah, I think you're doing a lot of things right. I can tell you, after only I don't know, I, my true deconstruction has only been about a year, probably. Mm -hmm. But I can never go back, man. No, uh, it's like. Being on the other side, it's like asking me to be a teenager again. Like I, yeah. I just can't, I can't see things like that anymore. It would be yeah. impossible. And there's so much liberation and there's so much love on the other side that I think people are afraid to experience. Um, so, but it's, thanks it, for sharing. It, what I'll say it, it is, it is scary. It, it is scary to step away from the, from a safe place and you know, I'd encourage anyone to take that step. If you're feeling, if you're feeling that tug, take that step. And the thing that's great about now is there's so much, so many resources now and, and so many, um, people expressing the same sentiment that I didn't have 10 years ago, even yeah. that, um, now's really the time. If you're feeling that tug, it's like, I sure feel the tug of non-belief, man. <laughs> no, it, it's a it's a really great it, it now's the time really to start your own, you know, forge your own path. Take your journey. I, I look it's a journey and step out on that journey. You know, because yeah. it, it's uh you'll learn a lot about yourself and a lot about others, and I think you'll be a better person. Well, do you want to plug yourself in any of your shit? <laughs> Yeah, you can go to seannarrates.com. I'm an audiobook narrator um, on the side, hopefully hopefully a full-time in the next few years. But seannarrates.com is kind of the hub for everything. Um, or if you want to find find the, the podcast, 
the AXPX.com. Like MXPX, because I'm an MXPX fan. AXPX.com. I knew that's what it was. Because I know I got I was getting sick of typing it all out. So uh <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna do the MXPX thing as a little homage to them. So yeah, the AXPX.com is the podcast there. I mean, this is, there's so many good conversations on there, and uh I'm really glad I did it. So it's kind of like this archive of of stuff. Yeah. So that's about it. Buy well, my audiobooks. <laughs> Well, cool. And we'd invite everybody on the cruise, but it's booked. Ah, I know. Dude, we good call on that. <laughs> we snatched that up. Yeah, I told Sarah right away that thing's going to be full right away. So, yep. Now. And then it was full the next day. So, rock and roll. Well, thanks, Sean, for everything, man. We'll connect sometime soon. And um, if you're listening to this, check out Sean's resources and um, stay tuned. I'm going to be doing a couple more videos here in the near future. So thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you.